Let's open our Bibles to Exodus chapter 20. Exodus chapter 20. This evening, as we continue to go through our study on the Ten Commandments, we come to the fourth commandment tonight, the last commandment that deals in our relationship with God. And the next six we'll look at, Lord willing, will be our relationship with each other. God is setting these parameters. He's setting these conditions. He's setting these, let's just call them what the Bible calls them, commandments, commandments, mandates. They're mandates that are going to enhance our life. And, and this one that we deal with tonight, the fourth commandment, has gotten a lot of scrutiny, and understandably so, because it, it, is, it is partially ceremonial for the children of Israel. It was something that they did in, in response to their relationship with God, something that you and I would not at all, we wouldn't see ourselves at all bounded to it. But yet, Jesus says something we're going to look at tonight that I'm so glad that he said this because it gives all wonderful perspective on this fourth commandment. This fourth commandment in verse 8 of Exodus chapter 20 is to, to remember the Sabbath day, to keep it holy. Verse 9, six days you shall labor and do all your work, but, verse 10, on the seventh day, or that seventh day is the Sabbath. It's the Sabbath of the Lord your God. Note that. In it you shall do no work, nor do your sons or your daughters. They'll be happy about that. They don't like to work anyway. They're trying to get them to do their chores. He says, neither your son or your daughters, nor your maid servants or female servants, nor your cattle, or working with your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates. No one's to do anything. Then verse 11. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth and the sea and all that is in them and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it or made it holy, set it apart. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for, Lord, these commandments that you give, these mandates that, Lord, we, we found out through the New Testament they're good. They're not bad. They're not to be thrown out. They're not to be old school. No, they're to be applied today. So, Lord, show us through your word today how to apply this fourth one because it, it raises all kind of questions. But thank you, Lord Jesus, for your words and what you give and what you say. Speak to us by way of your Holy Spirit, to your glory and our good. In Jesus' name, amen. I remember years ago, especially when I was a young Christian, I, you asked me, what does Sabbath mean? I would say it means seven. You used to thinking I was all that smart. It doesn't mean seven. It means rest. It means to rest. It means to have a rest. It means to lay forth something. It means to, to lay out something and let it just sit there. Here's the picture word that the Hebrew gives for it. It is like a planted seed. It is to just lie there and then allow it to germinate, allow it to to root itself. It's not to be disturbed or moved or thrown around. Having this, this in our lives is appropriate, not for any reason of trying to make brownie points with God, but in everything, it's, it's something that's good for us. We talk about how you and I need to translate the Old Testament in light of the New Testament. Very important. Very important. Jesus, Jesus said multiple times, you've heard it said. And he would quote something from the Old Testament. And then he would say this, but I say unto you, boom. There weren't necessarily changes, but there were alterations that were made. Here's one of the biggest ones. This one lies at the top. And it's, just, it's how we approach, how we deal with this fourth commandment. And how is this commandment applicable in our New Testament living life? Where everything we have, Colossians says, 2.10 says, that we are complete in him. We're totally complete in Jesus. So there's, so there's nothing that we're to do that's outside of him. To, like, like, like this particular observance here that these people have to do. Let's look at Jesus' words. This is Mark chapter 2, verse 27 and 28. Mark chapter 2. Verse 27 and 28, I'm so glad Jesus says this. 
and and because it, it gives the the, the the New Testament perspective on this Sabbath, the Sabbath. Mark chapter two, verse 27, Jesus said to them, the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. He's saying here that the benefit of the Sabbath is for man, not man to do something or to achieve something in and of himself for the Sabbath. Look at verse 28. Therefore, the Son of Man is also, and Jesus makes this decoration, he is the Lord of the Sabbath. He is the master over all understanding in this. Jesus says in verse 27 that the Sabbath is for man. He, it's beneficial for man, for mankind. It, it is not something that he does to get any kind of benefits with God. No, it's something that he can do that will benefit himself. And of himself. And then Jesus says, just like in the direction that we read here, and we'll look at it again here in a little bit, God makes the point is that he is the one. It's the Sabbath of the Lord. And Jesus says that he is the Lord or the master, verse 28, of this Sabbath, of this rest. He's the connection. He has to be the connection. He is the connection for us. And our New Testament living and walk with him. You and I see things change from Old Testament to New Testament. And, and when it came together to meet with God, that changed too. See, their Sabbath day, that seventh day, Saturday, that Sabbath day was the time that they got together. Paul would do preaching and go into synagogues on the Sabbath day. Jesus read. He read the book of Isaiah there on the Sabbath day, on the seventh day. When the New Testament church was birthed, they began to take this new, new appropriation to, to meeting together, and they began to meet on the first day. They met on the first day, dealing with, it was just Sunday for us, they met on this first day because it was the day that he rose again. And it was called now the day of the Lord. Look on the screen, Revelation chapter 1, verse 10. Revelation chapter 1, verse 10. John is talking about when he gets this vision in, here in chapter 1 of Revelation. And he says he makes, he, he, he uses a calendar date here kind of. He says, and I was in the spirit. And look what he says here, on the Lord's day. On the Lord's day, which would be the first day of the week. We see that throughout, throughout the New Testament, the early church, is that they gathered together on the first day. Paul told the church of Corinth that in that collecting the offering for the Jerusalem church, he says, when you come together on the first day, on the Lord's day, the first day, when you come together for that, then collect your offering for that, for those people. So it was it was something that was definitely changed, something more enlightened, but also the description of it is the Lord today. He says here that, I, look what he says reading again from Revelation 1.10. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and I heard behind me a loud voice as a trumpet. And, and, it, and it moves on and you can read on in verse 11. It's Jesus coming out, revealing who he is. It just happens to happen, not by accident for sure, but it happens on the Lord's day that he begins to hear fully, like a trumpet, the voice of the Lord. Not excluding that you can't hear the voice of the Lord on a Friday. Not doing that, not doing that. But it just makes point here that there is something that is to be, is to be gently observed. I'm not saying some kind of legalistic way observed. Because you can, you can have this Sabbath with the Lord. You can have this Lord's Day any day of the week. But there's a traditional gathering that, that most of us as Christians have, and that's to have it on the first day of the week, on Sunday. And coming together and hearing, hearing hopefully from Jesus. It's the Lord's Day, the first day of the week. For, for, for us, it's Sunday. Neat movie. Me movie came out years ago called Chariots of Fire. 
Eric, Eric Little. Eric Little in 1924, it was in 1924 Olympics. He ran for Scotland. He, at that time in 1924, he would be clearly the fastest man, the fastest man on earth. Jesse Owens would come later on, and then he would, he would be even faster. But this guy, Eric Little, this guy could run. He was all set up to get a gold medal in the 100-meter dash. But something happened. First of all, he was a devout Christian. His parents were missionaries. He was born in China. <laughs> but something happened. The, the qualifications for the 100-meter dash that he was to run in was held on Sunday. And the whole point is, and the whole focus of that story has a lot to do with chariots of fire, is that he said, I will not run on the Lord's day. People were incensed with him, upset with him. His own country, Scotland, was he's going to throw away this medal. He's going to give it away for God? And he's like, yes, I am. I am. He, he said before this, I run for God, he said. What a heavy testimony. I run for God, Eric would say. And, and he said, I'm not going to run against God on his day. That was his conviction. He had a hard conviction. You he, he can't throw stones at that. It has to be respected. Great open door came. There was a guy on the team, traded with him in the 400-meter race, and let Eric Little run in that race, which was on a Thursday. Okay, So he ran that race, and that wasn't his race. He's usually sprinting 100 yards, but he got in that race, and he won the 400 yards. God honored him. He honored his, his conviction. I, br I bring him up because I want you to be aware of the fact that there needs to be convictions in your life and my life when it comes to Time with God. Time with God. Rest in God. I don't, need, I don't have to use the word Sabbath, even though it can be used. The New Testament talks about it. we have a Sabbath. We have a rest now from Jesus that we cease from our works. We don't have to do works to be approved of God. No, the work of Jesus on the cross approved who you and I are in our faith in him. You and I are called to, to have connection with God. And, and, and there should be some conviction in it, too. Some conviction in it, too. Let's, let's look at the verses here, verse 8 through 11. First of all, in verse 8, we see what to do with the Sabbath, what to do with the Sabbath. We're to remember it. We're to remember this rest day to keep it holy. That word remember is similar to the word that Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. You mark it. You and I mark it. You and I observe it. You and I don't let it just be drifts off and drifts away. We take it very seriously. We make note of it. And God is telling them that they are to, to remember the Sabbath day. And in remembrance, they're to keep it separated, keep it holy, let it be sacred, set apart. Whenever you and I have time with the Lord, rest with the Lord, like we even sung about that tonight, Whenever you and I have those times, we need to remember to keep it holy. Keep it holy. For Israel, it was a statement of their devotion to God, but also their witness to the rest of the known world at the time. They, they wouldn't do it like Eric Little. He, he, I'm just not going to do it. And they didn't do it. And we see them letting that be a testimony and be a witness. So, what to do with it, we're to remember it and keep it holy. In verses 9 and 10, we see the order of the Sabbath, and it's very clear, and you know it. Six days you shall labor, and, from, and he says here, and do all your work, do all that you're supposed to do. But verse 10 says there's a seventh day. There's a seventh day. And notice what it's described as in verse 10. I, I mentioned it earlier. Sabbath of the Lord your God. And now, the, and Jesus is the Lord our God, and he says that he's the Lord of the Sabbath. So our time with him is something that is, there's a connection with him. We have a, a full connection with him. We have a full contact, our relationship with him, with the Lord our God. 
It is something that we don't bring in the rest of our life in. I wish we could do that, all of us, myself included. I wish I can leave stuff that I'm dealing with out there and leave it out there and come in to this place or not even just this place, my own personal devotions that we have, you and I have every morning. To be able to to keep it holy and not let anything infringe upon the Lord of the Sabbath. That Jesus remains that. Talks about here about this order of the Sabbath too, is that you're, you're to make sure that people in your in your around you are not causing other people to not do it. No one shall work. And he gives a list there of running lists of sons and daughters and servants and female servants and cattle. He just goes, strangers that even come. And the point is, we're to recognize this day or this time very holy. And, and, and everybody else needs to comply that, that you would have control over. Jer- uh, Joshua said the same thing. For me in my house, we will serve the Lord. Joshua was was making the point is that everything, everyone and everything around me, he was talking about cattle and his horses and everything else that Joshua had. We're, we're going to serve the Lord. We're going to live for the Lord. And, and that's every Christian has to make that decision personally about their own individual life. I understand there's other people in our lives that we don't, we can't make that. We can't make them do that. But, but we need to start with us. For us. And as much as we can have control of, We're going to serve the Lord. And that is something that Joshua says that we need to say, too, because he's the Lord of the Sabbath. He's the Lord of the Sabbath. Now, I want you to take heed again and understand that this is not only talking about Sundays. No, what we're talking about, it's time with the Lord. It's time that you and I connect with the Lord. The book of Colossians says that we're, don't let anyone judge you about Sabbath. And it says it in the plural, Sabbath, which means that you're ritualizing and you're doing something. He says, he says don't let anybody do it. You don't do that. You don't, you don't have that kind of ritual thing happening. So don't, don't be judged by that kind of thing. You and I are to call to, to understand that we're not confined to just a particular, a particular kind of routine, if you would. God. There's a discipline, and that's a good thing. But a, but a ritual routine with God can become very, very legalistic and very, very, the Bible calls it dead religion. No, it's, it's about God calling you and I to a Sabbath time. Calling us, yes, on the day of the Lord. I think that should be appropriate. I say that not because I'm, I'm the pastor here and want people to come. No, I say that because, yes, there, there should be this, that at one time in the week that, that you get together, that we get together with other Christians, but even more so we get together corporately being able to sing to God and give him glory and praise as due to his name. It's a time with the Lord. It's not. It's bigger than a day. It's, it's time with God. Third thing about this here in verse 11, here the last verse concerning this subject is that in the sixth day, he says, in six days, the Lord made heavens and earth and the sea and all that's in them. And look what it says there, and rested on the seventh day. I don't want to see a show of hands, but I know you know that doesn't mean that God needed to rest because he was tired. I probably probably used to believe that. Boy, God, man, that takes a lot to make the world, man. Takes a lot to spin those planets into existence and hold them there, you know, and all that kind of thing. And like God was like, came to the sixth day and said, Whoa, I'm tired. Need a break. No, he, he doesn't get tired like that. No, he rested, and it's brought here by Moses, who, who's the one that's bringing this book to. God's given him these words. It, it's talking about God. God stopped, he just stopped. He didn't continue in the routine. And it was finished. He didn't have anything else to do. He he wasn't going to do anything on the next working day. No, he got it all done in six days. But the point rested is that he stopped. And and it's beneficial for you and I to stop. Therefore, at the end of verse 11, therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day 
he he blessed it and he hollowed it or he made it holy. He made it holy. It, it is something that's that's going to be blessed. We're going to be blessed in doing it. It's also something that's going to be beneficial, holy or made hollow to us. And I would pray that for every person hearing my voice today is that you have time with God. You have you have a connection, a relationship with him, knowing that it's not bounded only on Sundays or Wednesday nights, but it's time with God. And and, and here's the thing. It's done alone. The Sabbath thing, but it's also done with other people, too. And it's no wonder then why in the Old Testament it said it's a good, it's a good thing that God's that God's people dwell together in unity. And then we have in the New Testament that tells us in Hebrews, don't forsake, don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together. It's beneficial. And it's also something that's holy. Let me give you three things and we're done that we benefit by in having. A, a rest in God. Rest in God. The first thing is that it's, time, it's a time of rest, number one, a time of rest in God. The point is, you and I are resting our soul. It's on the screen from Matthew eleven twenty nine. 29. You and I are resting, resting our soul. Many people, many good people like you and me, we, we find it appropriate, and we're able to rest our bodies. But not often do we really rest our souls. Your soul and my soul is how we perceive life. It is our perception. It is our perception. It's been formed by our life. It's been formed by the parents you've had. It's been formed by the, the, the neighborhood you lived in as a child and where you even live now. It's formed by whatever education that you've had. Our souls are how we see. And our souls need rest because Jesus says here that since he's the Lord of the Sabbath, take my yoke upon you. Yoke is that thing that they put on beast of burdens to drive them left or right. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. That means really investigate me. For I am gentle, Jesus says, and I'm lowly of heart. That, that pretty much just means I'm not, I'm not pushy. I don't push things. He says, so I'm gentle and I'm lowly in heart. And he says there, when you do learn of me, when you take my yoke from me, look at the last line there, you will find rest for your souls. It, it's finding a rest that, that will Plenish you and I and replenish you and I every time we connect with God. Every time we come to Jesus and, and take his yoke. And when we come to Jesus and learn from him how life should be engaged. We'll find out that he's gentle and lowly and we'll find rest for our souls. So the first thing here is time to rest in God. That's, that's what we need to find out. That's what we need to discover in this New Testament Sabbath. Number two, it's time to reflect on God. Time to reflect on God. We are, we are products, you and I, of what we perceive, like the soul, and what we take in. Jesus said this, the lamp of the body is the eye. And he says, if, if the eye is dark, then the whole body's dark, or the whole soul's dark. And Jesus was giving a great credence to this reality of how you and I see things. And you and I need to regularly see Jesus, see God. I'm not talking about in a literal way through our natural eyes. I'm talking about something even greater than that. The Bible calls it the eyes of our understanding, Ephesians. Ephesians 1 says, Paul is praying that they would have the eyes of of understanding. That means the eyes of, of reason, of conclusion. I understand now what is. And here, it's in Psalm 63, verse 2. David said, so I looked into your sanctuary. That's a place where he ends up having his Sabbath rest. I look into your sanctuary. You and I look into the sanctuary of the glory and presence 
and spirit of God, not just here in this little place, but also at home or on our front porch. There with our Bibles open and our, our hearts open to him, we can enter into a sanctuary wherever, on a hospital bed somewhere. He says here, I look for you in the sanctuary. That's in a place that God dwells. And he says, I'm looking for two things. Look what David's looking for. Number one, I, I'm looking to see your power. That, that's the demonstration of your, your impact. It is the move of God. It is the superior move of God, his power. His power is, is a demonstration of his, his ultimate absolute of control over everything. David says, when I move into this place of sanctuary, this place of Sabbath, I, I see how powerful you really are. For someone who has cancer, that's what they need to say, huh? The power of God. For someone who's unemployed, that's what they need to say. The power of God. For someone who's having any kind of area in their lives, and we all have them, we all have our list. One of the greatest things we can say is how great God is in the midst of this. The second thing he says he sees is your glory. Your glory. And that's, that's everything pointing to you. Glory. We talk about glory is focus. It's focus. God gets the glory. That means he gets the, the focus. It's everything pointed to God. Because when we go outside, outside those sanctuaries, wherever they may be here or whether it be home, or when we walk out and got to go to work or you got to go to school or you got to go to places that, that, that you're subject to, they, they pretty much move and run you. You got to go into 64. Woohoo! That's a place you got to really be a Christian to be driving around. When you go to these kind of places, wherever we go, we, we need to see that the reality is everything focuses on God. And when it does focus on God, he's magnified. He's glorified. David says, I look not only for your power to see your power, but I also look to see your glory. I look to see this reality of truth that everything points to you. You are everything. The, old, the New Testament says God is our all in all. And we have everything, all we need is in him, in him. So it's about reflecting, reflecting on God. Number one, rest in God. Number two, reflect in God. And the last one here, number three, is time to restore, to be restored by God. Time to restore by God. It's on the screen, it's Psalm 51, verse 12. David is confessing of his sin. And one of the things that David needs to have happen, and only God can do it, David says it, restore to me the joy of your salvation. David's not just talking about salvation of his soul, that he'll be in heaven one day. He's talking about the joy, the very fact is that God is willing and able to save in his life. David wants to know, or needs God to restore this the word joy means assurance of, assurance of your salvation, that your mercy is new and that you will come and save me no matter where I'm at. I tell you, when life gets hard, when life gets difficult, it snuffs out the joy of our salvation and it snuffs out, it takes out like a, like a candle blown out and, and we don't have that joy and that security in knowing that God will save. He is forever faithful. And in his faithfulness, you and I can find him faithful. You and I need time to rest, to rest our souls. That, 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 that could be contributing to our lives' physical pain. I say it all the time. They say it, uh, stress, 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 uh, stress. Stress involves pain, and, and, and stress is just an indication that there's unrest in your perception, in your soul. Jesus says, I'll give you rest for your soul. Also, we need time to reflect. I, I need to see God. I need to see him, and not only his power and his glory. Praise God, we can see that. But there's, I need to see him loving. I need to see him forgiving. 
I need to see him merciful because that's who he is. Jesus said it. We talked about it. Jesus said in Matthew eleven twenty nine, 29, learn of me. Learn of me. Learn of how I really am. Stop, stop figuring me out on your terms. No, hear what I'm saying. See what I'm doing. I'm touching lepers and I'm talking to prostitutes and I'm, I'm a person who's faithful and there. Jesus says, learn of me. <laughs> learn of me. And what a, what a blessing when we learn of him. When we reflect on God, we see God as he truly is. Truly is. And there's a lot of good things to see about him. There's a lot of good things that, that we need to see him as. That's what, that's what the book of Revelation is all about. It's the revelation of Jesus Christ. And you and I need to see, see Jesus as he is. As he is. And then lastly, restore. Restore. How we need to be restored. How our, the joy of our salvation need to be, be restored. My vision, my hope, and, and everything that you, you and I have in our lives needs to be restored. And God is doing restore. He's the one to do it. Do a word study on the word through the Bible restore. Oh, there's some good verses there. How God will, will restore. He gives, he, gives, he gives Job double what he had. He restored double unto Job, to Job, excuse me. And he gives him, and God is so faithful to do that kind of stuff. God is so faithful. Don't make him do it. Can't claim him to do it. We can just trust him to do what's best for his glory and our good. Right before Matthew eleven twenty nine is Matthew eleven twenty eight. Look what Jesus says there. Come unto me, or come to me, all you who labor. That's people who are working. That's the first six days. God says you do all your work in the first six days, he told Moses and the children of Israel. All of you who labor, and, and beyond labor, look at the next phrase, and are heavy laden. Those are people who are, who are holding something that's a, man, it's, 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 a, it's like holding backpacks or bags on you. It's like just holding burdens. I got the neatest little wood figure. I got it at the thrift store. And it must be Pilgrim from Pilgrim's Progress. And it's a guy who's just hunched over, and he's hunched over, and he's barely making You can see the anxiety in his face. Whoever carved it really carved the face. and they, But he has on him just multiple baggage, just tons of stuff that's weighing him down, holding him back, slowing him down. That's what Jesus is talking about. Not only you who got a lot of work to do, you got a lot to do. You raising children. You got a lot of labor. You who are, who are in the Navy, you got some labor, don't you? Doesn't matter where you are. There's labor to do. The Bible says it this way, and we agree. If a man doesn't work, don't let him eat. And the reality is this. If he don't work, he ain't eat. <laughs> this doesn't come that way. So, so the Bible is just very clear about that. We all got to labor. We all also will have heavy laden in our things that are heavy, heavy in our lives. Jesus says, come to me, you who labor, you're heavy laden. And look what he says here. You come to me and I will give you rest. I will give you rest. Jesus will. He'll give us rest. I I'm convinced now, and, and you let the Holy Spirit convince you, but I'm convinced that we're not going to find the fullness of this Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 rest unless we rest in him unless I, I set time with him. Bigger than just the observance of a Sabbath day, Old Testament. But no, it's a connection with him, where I connect with him, where you connect with him, and we find rest. I believe that is the New Testament application of this Sabbath thing here, the fourth commandment. It's, it's now the day of the Lord. We need to take advantage of that. But we also need to take advantage any other days of the Lord, he would call us to connect with him. Let's be faithful and do that and find rest. Amen. Find rest. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your word. And thank you so much, Lord, for just the, the understanding of your word. And thank you how it applies. And it only applies because we, we have the reference of scriptures that give us the application. 
So Lord, we look to you to let your Holy Spirit now continue to teach us and give us instruction and guidance and give us, Lord, insight of this word, especially this one tonight. Show us the importance of you being the Lord of the Sabbath. You're the Lord of the Sabbath, Lord. And that Sabbath was made for us. It was made for our good. So thank you so much that we can find those words in your word and help us by your spirit to apply them in our lives. So Father, I pray for all of us because all of us in this room labor and have some stuff that's weighing us down. Oh, Father, may we just trust you. We May we just trust you, Jesus, to be the one that bears our love. We, we want to come to you and discover true, lasting rest. So, Father, we know wherever we go from here, whatever happens to us on the way home or whatever we wake up to tomorrow, we can be assured that you're with us and that you will keep us. Thank you for your love and grace and forgiveness. Thank you for your compassion in our lives. So go with us where we go from here. And we want to give you the praise and all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless your hearts. Have a good rest of the week. Let's stand.